proud of the community that we have here convened uh, entrepreneurs tackling some of the world's most pressing challenges. And I wanted to, before I introduce Ollie, uh, one of them, uh, I wanted to tell you about a couple of the others that are here in this building. So above us, we have some 150 plus entrepreneurs working across 43 or so different startups. And it includes startups like Ping. Raise your hands if you've heard of Ping. Awesome. So they're able to, it's essentially a device that works in the renewable energy sector. It's able to tell from the sounds emitted by wind turbines um, what blade needs maintenance and, and when. And then we've got IO Energy who have joined us more recently. They're there to help consumers take advantage of the savings you can get from renewable energies. And they have a, um, a pre-registered sign-up list on their website, uh, a little plug for them. Um, we also have RIASC in the building. So RIASC is looking at uh, catastrophic, catastrophic risk uh, that insurance companies need to be aware of when it comes to the storms associated with climate change. And XDI, uh, who's heard of XDI? I was blown away when I first heard of XDI, yeah. I mean, Rowan and his, and his team uh, are getting some incredible traction. They're looking at predictions 20, 30 years into the future of the impact of climate on physical assets, helping insurance companies and fund managers make decisions about where they put their investment. So right here in this building, we have a lot of people that are focused day in, day out on tackling the, the world's most pressing problems. And I thought, what better subject to kind of have a, a deep dive into for the next 10 minutes or so uh, than climate change and the impact on wine. And we're not presenting to you the three most you know, definitive experts on the subject by any matter, um, but we've had to think about some of the, the issues associated with it, and we wanted to spark some discussion. Um, and online, we have the, the spark um, attendance. And uh, following this, we're going to learn about a product. It's actually the first time it's ever been tasted uh, in Australia. And uh, you're going to have a tasting of that, which will be awesome. And then we'll go back to wine tasting with Alistair, Turong, Maka, and the crew from the lane. So that's what we've got going for the next 15 or so minutes. Um, I'd like to introduce Ollie. Come forward. Great. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, good evening, everybody. So yeah, for the next 10 minutes, um, I'm just going to have a bit of a conversation with uh, Sarah Keogh here, who joins us from Bleasdale in Langhorn Creek, and with Richard Leesk from Leesk Agri and Hither and Yon Wines uh, in McLaren Vale, which is the same region that I'm a grower in. And I'm also one of the co-founders of Platform, so one of the startups here um, based at Stone & Chalk in Adelaide. So um, yeah, I just wanted to start off, obviously, um, Wine Australia have recently published um, a climate atlas looking at the likely impacts of a two degree change on all of our, our wine regions in Australia. And I just wanted to ask you guys, like what would, like you're at the coal face of climate change, what would a, a two degree average change actually mean for you? And what are you actually doing about it now? So maybe Richard, I'll start with you if that's okay. Uh, thanks Ollie. Uh, uh, good evening everyone. Um, look, two degrees change, you know, in relative terms, if you know, that will change the industry totally. But I think, you know, we're already seeing it uh, in terms of events and extreme weather um, that's affecting us now. And it has been for probably the better part of 10 to 15 years, to be honest. Uh, we know that harvest is earlier by at least three weeks, uh, probably a month over time. So that, that's changing the way um, the season runs for us and, and where we need to spend time with people and equipment. Um, but really... Um, the major issue for us is uh, the changes in seasonal uh, fluctuations. So we're, we're seeing reduced winter rainfall, we're seeing reduced spring rainfall, and we're seeing extended heat periods from a lot earlier in the season. So that's putting pressure on resources, uh, most notably water. Um, so water really is the key factor for us uh, in McLaren Vale and probably is in Langwell Creek. And how we utilise that and, and how we make it go further is probably the key um, element in how we tackle what is a, 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 chip, a difficult thing, which is climate change. Um, the best way of, that we're looking at doing that in our, uh, in our business is to obviously increase our resilience in our system, uh, which is around making the soil uh, a bit more receptive to capturing as much free water as we can get out of the sky, uh, holding it for longer, uh, making it more available to the plant systems that we've got. Um, but we're also looking at changing our varietal mix uh, and our rootstock mix in our vineyard so that we're much more water efficient and we're able to handle 
uh, those heat periods a lot um, you know, more robustly, if you like. So changing from traditional French varieties to more Southern Italian, Portuguese, Spanish varieties that are more able to handle the hotter weather. Can you tell us a little bit about your, in terms of what you've done, about your travels around the world with your Nuffield Scholarship? Um, well, so I, I was lucky enough to do a Nuffield Scholarship in 2019, and uh, my focus was on regenerative agriculture and what, it, um, what that system potentially could do for the wine industry. Um, that's based around increasing soil health through the use of diverse plant systems, uh, livestock interaction, and obviously reduced tillage uh, and keeping soil covered for a long period of time. Now, I think all of those things have relevance in the wine game. Um, it helps, certainly keeping soil covered helps lower soil temperature, uh, temperature in the canopy, temperature around uh, the fruit zone, but also it increases organic matter and increases the biological activity in the vineyard. Uh, a lot of that stuff we don't know what the interaction is now. Um, so if anyone's out there that wants to, uh, you know, help measure soil biology and, and what its, what its uh, effect on vineyard production and, and, uh, and capability is, that would be really good. Um, it's, it's a really interesting system that I think could translate well into vineyards uh, just with a very, very minimal amount of equipment and, and, and changes the way we do things. And um, yeah, so Sarah, in terms of if there was a two degree or when there is a two degree change in Langhorn Creek, like what does that mean for you at Bleasdale? What are you doing about it now? What are your plans in the future? Yep. Um, so I guess technology is one of the things that we're looking at, um, looking at um, improving our soil um, holding capacity as, uh, you know, pretty much everything that Richard said. Um, uh, we're on floodplains, so, and we're solely reliant on Murray River water. Um, so the two degrees change for us, um, I think we can cope with, it's the extremes. Um, so last year we had an extreme frost event, which wiped out huge areas of Langhorn Creek. Um, and once again, uh, three heat, really high heat um, periods throughout the season. So if we can manage those better um, through soil water holding capacity, um, through readily available water for the vine, so for the soil to hold the water and then the vine to be able to access it, um, whether that's um, regen farming, whether that's technology, whether we're looking at um, water conservation in using things like dendrometers or sap flow to accurately um, irrigate um, at when the vine actually needs it. Um, I think that path will have to, you know, sort of tread down. But for us, as we spoke earlier, um, the two degree change, not just Langhorn Creek, it's a whole river um, Murray system. So it's what happens in New South Wales and Victoria that is going to have a huge effect on what we do down in Langhorn Creek. So, um, You're actually also about to embark on your Nuffield Scholarship, which has been a bit curtailed this year around irrigation tech. Yes. Like, can you just talk about some of the irrigation solutions that people are already starting to use out there in the wine industry and yep. anything you can see maybe coming up in the horizon? Yeah. Um, so it's pretty common to use um, either Centec probes um, or gypsum blocks or neutron probes, which measures the amount of water that the vine uses in depth. Um, but um, as I said, dendrometers actually measure the expansion of a trunk or a shoot. Um, so um, that will better enable us to irrigate based on what the vine is actually requiring rather than what we think it is actually taking. Um, and also sap flow as well, doing the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, have you been using any of the mist? Because some of the Langon Creek oh, sorry, growers yeah, are yeah. like quite <laughs> innovative in, in yeah. different ways of of yep. irrigating? So we've got a couple of trials going on down at Langhorn Creek. The major one is a heat mitigation trial. Um, and we're using undervine misters to try and cool the, um, the, uh, the fruit zone, I guess. And we're sort of getting about a two, two to five degree de uh, decrease in temperature um, through that area. And we're also increasing the humidity. So um, not causing any um, disease because it's so hot and dry down there anyway. So it's, it's pretty, pretty it's like that pretty air conditioning, I guess, underneath the vines. Um, I guess one of the, the other interesting things that happened from that trial last year is um, where we had the misters, we had um, cooch, cooch is a weed in, in vineyards, it just draws too much moisture. Um, but it's uh, the only thing that actually got that block through. Um, and I used um, just an infrared 
camera on that area. Um, so where the misters were and we had hooch or anything green under, under vine, um, it was about um, 28 degrees. Um, in the mid rows where there wasn't any misters, I think it was about 38 and bare soil was something like 68 degrees. So, you know, just having something green, as Richard's talking, regen farming, just making sure that you've got some sort of cover over your ground, whether it's straw um, or grasses. Um, anything like that is and, certainly helpful. And hopefully people, as they just sort of travel around the regions of South Australia, will see the change, like you, you're probably leading a lot of the charge in McLaren Vale of like not having, not spraying out under vines and having various different crops planted mid rows and yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I certainly I wouldn't say we're leading the charge, but we're sort of, we're trying to push the, the boundaries of, um, you know, what a vineyard's supposed to look like. You know, I think we've all had a preconceived idea of what it's what a vineyard looks like, and they're very neat and very linear and uh, almost manicured. And I think what we're understanding now is that um, sure we're going to have to give something up to get something back. So we're going to have to give a little uh, give away a little bit of soil moisture. But if we've got a we've got a living plant underneath the vine that's cr that's transpiring, that's creating a little microclimate mm. that Sarah's seeing as well, where we can actually see a, a reduction in temperature and also get that symbiotic relationship between the plant root and the soil microbiome that we don't really know yet, but we understand that there's a nutrient transfer and an energy transfer between the plants um, that helps then make the system a little bit more resilient. If we look at natural ecosystems, they're naturally evolved over time. They handle these extremes a little bit better than these monocultures. And I think if we understand that, you know, in, in farming, we do focus on one particular crop, and in this case, it's grapevines, but we have a whole other um, mid-row area where we can play around with different plant species to bring in different attributes uh, and change our climate, our microclimate, uh, to help us get through these extreme periods. Well, then that builds resilience in the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. You've kind of touched on the two areas of like the wine industries tackling climate change from sort of a tech based approach. But it's also like Richard said, is, is really looking at how we can actually just work with nature rather than trying to spray it out, really try and harness it. And that's probably an area where there's just tons of opportunity at the moment with the way that the industry is moving and regulations are moving. And, yeah. I, and I think it worked. I mean, it ties in with obviously, um, you know, consumers are getting more and more engaged in the products they're buying. They want to understand where it comes from. They want to understand how it's grown. Um, you know, and I think there's a there's a great opportunity in in part of the vineyard systems that we use that we used to see as as vacant and not really useful to be able to put in, you know, insectary plantings and, and beneficial insect plantings and use them to actually help make the system more resilient. So it's it's an exciting time. I mean, a lot of it's not new. And a lot of it's being used in, in many different farming systems around the world. But I think bringing it together and utilising those good bits in the vineyard industry is certainly um, you know, something we should look forward to. Um, and the wine industry's um, basically made, it, made its target to be carbon neutral by 2050. And I wanted to ask both of you whether you thought that that was aggressive enough uh, thinking about like 30 years to become carbon neutral and also like what are you guys actually practically doing if anything to kind of get to that point already? Uh, maybe Sarah first if that's yeah. okay. Um, probably not, <laughs> not quick enough. Um, certainly we're looking down the path that we don't have solar um, on our winery at the moment so just a simple thing like that to try and um, reduce our um, electricity um, but um, yeah I think it's uh, things that, other things that we're doing, I guess, is we're trying to go away from herbicides, insecticides, um, fungus, uh, use softer fungicides, um, certainly doing a lot more mid-row cover crops. Um, and just as an observation this year, huge amount of um, aphids around roses and things like that and thistle um, in, the, in the cover crop that we had a seven species um, flower mix. There was, I could not find an aphid in it. So, you know, that was really quite positive and exciting. Um, I guess there's that trade-off though. So we're trading chemical for diesel um, and how we, we, we do that better. Um, on floodplains, we've got a lot of... Um, um, large plants, um, oh, I can't remember what they're called, <laughs> but they've, uh, they grow very quickly. So we need to be able to keep them down um, so that we get good airflow, because if we don't get good airflow, we'll be going in with more chem um, fungicide chemicals to control disease. Um, so there's a few trade-offs, um, 
but I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, and we were, we were talking about electrical, you know, tractors. Why haven't yeah. we got electrical tractors? Yeah, it's one of those, because obviously there's people think, like, hopefully in the room and also online, just kind of thinking about, like, the wine industry and where things are going and sparking kind of ideas for, for opportunities. And really, there's, like, a dearth of progress in electri electric tractors. We were just saying, I don't think you can buy a diesel car in Great Britain after 2030 or something like that. And, but the farming industry um, doesn't feel like we're on that path yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, they're coming. I mean, there's, there, there are models of, available in Europe and things, so getting them to run longer will be a bit of a challenge, and I, I don't profess to be across it. I'm going to come at it from a different point of view, is that I think if, you know, from what we're trying to achieve in our system is that we want the vine to be as healthy as it possibly can without any um, major inputs from us. So that, that stems from getting the soil right and getting it as healthy as we can and, and enhancing that microbiological element. Um, because right at the moment, before we get on a tractor and do anything, we ask ourselves, is this the best thing for the system? Based on carbon retention, based on soil microbiome, um, you know, damage, if you like, for want of a better term. Now, if we can't answer those two things positively, then we look at it and say, maybe this isn't the right way to be doing it. So, we, you know, our long-term goal is to basically halve our tractor passes. So not only does that have an impact, uh, obviously, what we're putting out, but it also has an impact about how the system then loses carbon throughout this thing. So I think we need to... We get, in, we get very routine with things, especially in farming, because we're rhythms, seasons, you know, very rhythmical. We start here, we go to there, and we start again. You now, I think to flip that and, and really drill down and say, do I need to do this tractor pass right now? What is its goal? Is it, just, is it just to make things look neat and tidy? Is that relevant? You know, and I think that's the big question we need to start asking ourselves, because I think we could get rid of a third of those tractor passes immediately. No, that's a great, yeah, great point. And um, I was just going to say, um, I did a little bit of research just before this um, session, uh, just about actually the carbon footprint of the wine industry. And there was a report done by the AWRI, so our kind of science body for, for wine. And 68% of the carbon footprint of our industry is related to those 750 mil glass bottles, which literally haven't changed for a couple of hundred years. So um, they were saying, like, if, if you want to look at an area to innovate, look at what we can do with how we deliver like wine to consumers and we're already starting to see like um changes in the last year towards like kegs delivering um wine to on-premise and then you've got um they call them bagnums so rather than a magnum it's a magnum of a wine in a bag in a bag but somehow pitching it as a bagnum that's the thing that's kind of catching off in the uk at the moment and um yeah and i know that there's kind of paper bottles coming out there's bottles that are plastic that fit through letter boxes there's you know there's a discussion that we probably can't have here tonight about whether the wine industry should you know also be like the beer industry and and in south australia you get 10p uh recycling um uh back when you when you recycle your bottles but actually using that as part of a fund to kick off like actually changing this industry because pushing down you know to growers uh, who are on quite low margins often, like the change without any assistance is going to be tough. So like we have to think about like how are we actually going to create new sources of um, income or like, yeah, new sources of, of funding to help us make that change. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so I have one last question for um, both Sarah uh, and Richard. So basically there's two th main things that the wine industry can do, you know, like we can do mitigation and we can do adaption to climate change. And I just wanted to ask you a question, like I'm about to give you $10 million and you can plant a new vineyard anywhere in Australia and you can plant any variety you would like. Um, what would you plant and where and, and why? So I'm going to ask that first to Sarah, if that's okay. Um, yeah, uh, just given climate change and if, if we had enough water, I'd probably go to KI. Just a beautiful spot, great tourism. Um, if we were to continue in Langhorn Creek, um, I'd probably stick with the same varieties. Um, we did discuss Malbec as being a bit of a fickle um, variety to grow. Um, maybe um, still persist with that, but at lesser um, uh, quantity and possibly some more Grenache because uh, you know, it's just something that uh, handles the heat um, and the extremes very well in, in the area. 
Thank you. And Richard, the same question. Uh, well, hopefully I wouldn't turn it in $10 million into $2 million, but that happens a bit in the wine industry. Yes. Um, I, <laughs> I Look, don't have either. You know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't move from McLaren Vale. I know that's very biased, but I think we've, we've got a couple of things that, uh, that make us unique and, and quite a good place to grow. We're, water security in McLaren Vale is, is very strong, uh, almost as strong as anywhere in Australia. We've got uh, a reasonably well-managed uh, local aquifer, which has been um, managed since 1991 um, really well uh, and is stable. And then we've got the, the, I think it's the world's, you know, largest recycled water network um, coming out of the Christie's Beach plant uh, that now irrigates at least 50%, if not more, of the, uh, of the region. So we're not reliant on Murray River water at all. Um, so we're very self-sufficient in that respect. So water being key, I would move. And I think, you know, even though there's some challenges around heat, um, we're close to the coast, we have good airflow, we have all of those things, we're close to a really good market um, and it's a really wonderful place to live. I'm not sure I'd want to uproot. Um, and, it, and I think we're seeing some great, um, some tremendous uh, optimism around the alternate variety scene and, and, those, and those Mediterranean varieties that are going to suit that climate really well. So I think we're well positioned. It's not without challenges, but um, I'm not in a big hurry to move. Um, uh, also from McLaren Vale, so I'll, uh, that's great to hear. And again, we completely lucked out by landing in the region. And um, yeah, the, the Wollonga Water Basin is an amazing resource that we have, which really enables our industry to be like sustainable, like long into the future. And you know, avoid because I think Andy was talking about like the social license to grow grapes, and maybe things will change over the like coming decades. But I think McLaren Vale is incredibly well set. And and again, Richard, I think you've plant how many varieties have you planted in your vineyard from like southern Europe that are heat tolerant? Uh, so. so we're up to we're nearly at 15, 15 different varieties now, not including the traditionals. And and again. Um, Richard's being very modest because he's uh, hither and yonder the bushing kings of uh, this, well, I think it was this year or last year, of McLaren Vale. So, yeah, no, those, vi like, those varieties like Nero Diavolo are winning awards. And, and again, you're, it, it's really exciting that that's happening with, with real proponents of, um, of like regenerative agriculture. And we've got, I think, Duncan from K Brothers I saw here as well, who was another winner and, again, a real kind of forward thinker in that space. So... Um, with that, I will uh, wrap this session up to let it all move on. But thank you so much for your time and input. And um, yeah, hopefully, like, please spark ideas that will help um, the wine industry to be more sustainable in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really good. Well, you can take a seat if you like. Uh, really interesting at the end, Ollie, there, that touching on that social license um, to grow grapes. Uh, which segues, interestingly, to our next guest, joining us from London, and we'll have them on the screen soon. So Henry, I've known for over 10 years, and uh, recently we were having a conversation about uh, climate change and the impact that it has on the industry. And I guess in some silver lining, um, you were talking, Henry, about some regions that are growing grapes that previously couldn't in, in the UK. Um, was it in the UK? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Henry, to say a few words and introduce uh, Matthew Jukes. Meanwhile, um, we've got a team over here and we're going to be um, preparing, pouring and serving to you all uh, this incredible product, which you're about to hear more about now. Over to you, Henry. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Dan. And yeah, as, as Dan said, we're, we're actually um, coming to you from, uh, from Battersea and uh, out the back of Matthew's uh, place <laughs> in Battersea, just, just south of um, London. Um, as, uh, as Dan said, um, it, we've known each other for 10 years. I'm actually a, a South Australian uh, boy. Um, I grew up in South Australia um, and have always been involved in uh, the wine industry, which is where the, um, I guess the relevance lies here. Um, my family has always been involved in the wine industry. My, my um, dad, Andrew Hardy, is a, who many of you in the room will know, is a, is a winemaker. Um, so it's a, it's a topic that's very um, close to close to my heart and I know very close to Matthew's as well. Um, but I, I moved to uh, moved to London um, at the end of last year and actually caught up with, uh, with Matthew um, with the intention uh, of, uh, of, you know, trying to find more work within the wine industry um, in, in sales. Um, I've been sort of jumped around a little bit within the wine industry from production and then to sales and marketing and then um, a bit, you know, sort of uh, spread myself around a little bit in that sense. Um, but um, 
it was it was through catching up with Matthew and and discussing um, certain jobs in London that we got talking about um, his creations, um, which you'll be um, you'll be tasting this evening. Um, and uh, upon tasting them, for me, it was um, it was a real no brainer. It was one of the one of the most exciting moments of my life, actually, um, and a real turning point, I think. Um, and I feel very privileged to be to be working with Matthew and with these um, delicious drinks. Um, so I'll pass on to Matthew. He can tell you a little bit more about them um, in, in, in some detail, um, and then we can discuss them whilst we taste as well, and um, hopefully you enjoy them as much as uh, what, what we do. Thanks, Henry. Um, hello, everybody. It's, it's lovely to be a uh, part of this wonderful event and also um, to at least virtually appear in, in Adelaide um, for the first time this year. This is the first year in 22 years or something that I haven't been able to come to Australia for obvious reasons um, and always hang out in Adelaide. So I'm missing all of you guys. Uh, there are probably a few people in the room who... Um, who I would like to have a beer with at the Grace Emily or whatever. Um, and it's a great shame that we can't enjoy that. But listen, virtually is, is pretty cool. I know that um, the topic today is about the sort of future of wine. And, and I'm very much um, engaged in the future of wine, writing about, you know, Australian wines um, and also uh, tasting Australian wine and writing m m multiple articles about Australian wine. In fact, I did an Australian wine event just yesterday. Um, but the future of wine, as far as I can see, is to embrace um, drinking fewer but finer bottles of wine. And therefore, obviously, South Australia comes into that sector very strongly. But on your days off, um, and there are people having increasingly more days off the booze, um, giving you something palatable to drink um, that doesn't make you yearn for that glass of wine you're dodging. And, and that was really where, where this inspiration came from. Um, I took some of the tasting notes that I make about wine. So us wine writers are always accused of using rather florid language, using lots of descriptors like kind of peachy or, you know, touch of cucumber or citrusy or whatever. Of course, none of those things are, are used in winemaking, but they're, they're kind of descriptors that, that, that chime with the general public. Um, and I actually use those specific ingredients to make some pretty cool drinks. I think they're pretty cool drinks. Um, to replace wine for your AFDs. And, and, and the nice thing about this, and it, it has taken an awfully long time, I'm into my sort of fifth year of this project. Um, the nice thing about this is that we're getting the wine industry on side um, over here with the restaurateurs and the clubs and, and the like, um, realizing that selling, um, you know, cheap sort of um, sparkling kind of sodas and and, 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 and Coke and, or just water or, or, or sort of fruit drinks just doesn't really go with food, doesn't really go with the great food that you want to eat. And also wellness and, 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 and healthiness is a really um, emerging theme, um, not so much in my life, but certainly in Henry's. And, um, and, um, and so like keeping an eye on your calorie intake and all the rest of it, but without, again, sacrificing sophistication and kind of elegance. And so, yeah, I came out with these products. They're, they're not surprisingly called Jukes after my surname. And, um, and uh, they're little bottles that are individual portions for you. Each little bottle contains about the equivalent of two, two glasses of wine like that. When you, when you pour them and, mi and mix them with uh, water, whether it's still sparkling or tonic, whatever your, your taste desires, um, they kind of look like wine. Um, I'll just uh, give you a, a, little, um, a little sort of example about when you, when you pour them in, they, they're rather theatrical as well. They look pretty special, about half a bottle in there and um, give it a swirl and then just crack on like wine. I hope you're all doing that in the audience now. Um, they're made from fruit, veg, herbs, spices, all natural, um, edible flowers. Um, and uh, they're made in very specialist equipment in a little uh, arch, a railway arch, not far from where we're sitting now um, in Battersea, um, made by our team. Um, we have a small team of chefs who put it together. There's no specialist equipment necessarily in this kitchen. Um, we have a, a, a very low footprint as such in that um, all of our leftovers are, are just recycled back to farm. So it's just the f sort of skins and pith and fibres and stuff. It's all totally recycled back. And we have a pretty small electricity bill because all we're firing up is a, a fridge and a freezer. Um, and then we make these um, drinks by using the magical ingredient, um, apple cider vinegar. We get this organic apple cider vinegar. We macerate the fruit and veg 
in this um, amazing medium. And then that draws out the flavors and you end up with a, a, a drink eventually with a little bit of um, fine tuning and, and precision uh, that you've got in front of you in your glasses. I hope you're in, enjoying drinking them. Um, and you can clearly see that they're modeled to, to sort of smell intriguing and complex. Um, there are 25 odd ingredients in these. Uh, also to retain mouthfeel and richness on the palate, like a great wine, of course, um, and then have a very dry finish. Um, and so Duke's one, the, the white one has 16 calories for a glass. So it's a, a fraction of the glass of wine. And Duke's six just has 17, one more um, for, uh, for the red. Um, we have these two, one and six of the core range. And then we've got some seasonal kind of special bottlings. We made a rosé this summer. Um, and of course, because all the restaurants and hotels were, were locked down um, and uh, there was no trade at all, we pivoted very swiftly. Henry um, was extremely instrumental in that and, and sold direct to the consumer from our website and, and got through an enormous amount um, of stock like that. And in fact, we had to make another, another, another batch of, of the rosé, which is Duke's 8. And we just a, a, a week ago, 10 days ago, launched Duke's 2, which is a much more crimson colored carmine sort of colored uh red which is more evocative of um kind of tangy grapes like sangiovese and and barbera and fraser and sort of those italian kind of angular spicier sort of grapes um and that's an autumnal um an autumnal style for us uh, which has gone down awfully well um such that uh, last week we announced we're being poured in the british airways first class lounge at heathrow uh, not that they've got many customers at the moment, but it's a bloody good place to be uh, for a company like ours. So, yeah, look, um, it's going it's going pretty well. Um, Henry's head of sales, and so it's a challenging job with the situation that we have in the UK right now. Um, we're getting a second wave, um, and so uh, the businesses are trading um, pretty pretty slowly. But um, the enthusiasm to find something which is an alternative to drinking a boring bottle of water. Um, you know, putting some more cash in the till and some more margin because the margins you can make when you, you sell these drinks is similar to a, a serious wine. So that's pretty exciting. And also not sacrificing any joy when it comes to ordering your grub uh, means that we hope that when you're not drinking great wine, and, and this isn't a, this, these aren't drinks to be, to be made for like just teetotal people. These are drinks for drinkers. Um, when you're not drinking great wine, you can, you can keep your palate level nice and high uh, and enjoy enjoy a serious drink. Um, do you have anything to add to that, dude? I, I just I think probably a little bit just around the um, organic apple cider vinegar. In that it's a Matthew touched on it is such an important ingredient, and it and it truly is because it does it does um, sort of within the production process draw out all the all the great elements of the the fruit and veg that it's macerating with. But it also it also provides um, incredible sort of structure and and uh, and a, a dry snap at the end of the palate which yeah. is so crucial um when when you are um enjoying them with food um obviously with the other side of the thing uh, thing with apple cider vinegar is that it's incredibly um healthy it's incredibly good for you there's a lot of um studies out there that will um that will you know attest to the fact that it's it's incredibly um good for your stomach um so there's a there's a um, a lot of very very um, positive things um, from apple cider vinegar and it is uh, you know a really key ingredient of our drinks yeah um, and uh, yeah we're certainly we're certainly hoping whilst we're enjoying them over here in um, in Battersea and you you're lucky to have some um, there with you we we're working very hard on um, getting a whole lot more over to Australia so that um, so that uh, uh, when when's that likely to be when what's when, that When's it likely to be that you'll have the product over in Australia? Well, we're hoping it'll be there sort of um, in the first half of next year, hopefully very early next year. Yeah, awesome. Um, and just before we let you go, and we're about to go to wine tasting with Elaine, um, you, you mentioned to me the other day, Matthew, something about the process and, and kind of your, your carbon footprint in terms of the, the process of making this and the turnaround times for um, a batch. Can you talk a little bit more? Clearly, we're not um, subject to uh, vintage variation like the wine business. So we're, we're, we're pretty happy about that. Although um, the reason why we have a um, you know, pretty big fridge and a, and a big freezer is that we want to get consistency of our product. Um, and the ingredients are top, top, top level. So we're buying from the same suppliers as the great restaurants in London 
Um, and, and that's very, very important to us. So, so a bit like the wine business, you know, the provenance of the grapes and then how you handle them, which is all, uh, all important when it comes to making these drinks. And, and, and to answer your um, kind of turnaround time, it takes about 10 days um, to make a batch and then um, everything's hand uh, labeled, hand uh, capped uh, and then put into boxes. Um, you'll know from the packaging that there's a, there's a, a cute little extra layer that you can take off the outer label, unzips rather satisfyingly with some more information on it for you to understand what you're drinking because, of course, you've never seen anything like this before. And in fact, Australia's never seen anything like this before. As you said right at the beginning, this is the very first time that we've poured these uh, for you for you guys. So, so thank you for being the guinea pigs. But also, you know, in, in terms of production, it's quite nice to be able to make something, quite satisfying to be able to make something within, let's say, a two-week window from start to finish. Um, and so, yeah, I mean... That, that makes us awfully happy, and um, and the other point about that is that, that the electric the electricity that we use because the only thing we consume is electricity. I hope you can hear us. There's a there's a weird cracking on the line. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the the only thing um, that we consume is electricity, and our footprint is incredibly incredibly small. Um, I made the joke the other day that the um, the electricity, but it's a little bit um, it's very similar to my house where I'm sitting right now. Um, so it's like a just a domestic house. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the, the footprint is low then in that respect. Um, yeah. Matthew, Henry, great to have you join. Um, we're looking forward to seeing the product here in, in Australia um, and seeing you back over here enjoying a glass with us as well. Um, we're, our next stage is to, to move on to the tasting. So we're, um, we'll give you a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thank you.